Oh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 174 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. I uh, am doing this one wearing my noise-canceling headphones because there is so much shit going on outside here. I, you guys won't be able to hear it because this mic is sensitive, but if I take it off, I can hear sanding, I can hear uh, unloading of trucks, I can hear people arguing in Three different groups of people arguing in three different languages that I don't understand. And when I put the headphones on, all I hear is silence. Scratch that. They're outside the door. So uh, I may die halfway through this episode, but oh my God. This is the thing uh, about this place is it's, it's like it's the best place and the worst place at the same time. It's... Uh, it's a it's a fucking life saving headache, you know. It's like if the doctor was like, basically, what was happening before I had this place was I couldn't do my job, right? Couldn't film, couldn't do anything. So, basically, my career was diagnosed with AIDS, and the doctor comes in and he goes, "Lewis, your career has AIDS, uh, and if you don't do something to fix it, it will die." And I went, "Okay, fuck. Well, I have I've." I barely got enough money. And they go, well, don't worry. If you fix the AIDS, more money will come in. I'm like, all right, sweet. Okay, so I guess we'll have to fix it. What's the uh, what's the treatment, doctor? And they go, well, all of the problems that you have, all of the symptoms of AIDS, we can cure them, right? We can get rid of them, right? You don't you don't have time to film. You can't yell because you've got noise restrictions. You don't have enough space. There's nowhere to do your merchandise. Loosebeers.com slash merch. No slide season t-shirts are on sale now. You, you don't have all of this stuff, right? So what we can do is we can give you this pill and all of these symptoms will disappear. Uh, and I'll be like, oh, wow, that's amazing. I, well, I, I, yeah, I'll do it. How much does it cost? And they go, oh, it costs this much. And I go, oh, well, can't really afford it, but that's all right because, you know, as you say, once I fix my AIDS, the money will come in, right? Which did happen. And I'm like, fuck, are there any side effects? And he goes, yep. Yeah. So uh, you're going to have a headache 24 7. And uh, there's nothing you can do about it because, as good as this pill is, it still feels like knives in your brain. <laughs> So this place is amazing, but fuck, it's a headache. I, one one day, I know, I feel like maybe I just need to be a little bit grateful because even though I am uh, sitting in a warehouse surrounded by criminals with weapons and brothels and people yelling at each other and having domestics and maybe about in total, if you combine the 30 or 40 people, maybe seven teeth, at least I'm not at home. You know what I mean? At least I, At least I can come here and film, so... If I do get distracted, I get very. That's that's the thing about me. That's the one thing. I'm a. I feel like I'm quite a confident person. I never ever get nervous. I never like shut down. I'm I'm pretty good with like confrontation and stuff. But the only thing that makes me feel like horrendously self conscious is when I'm filming a video or doing a podcast and I know strangers can hear me right? Because it's one thing to get up on stage in front of strangers and perform and they go, oh, look, there's a, there's a guy, he's doing comedy. I might listen, right? That's, that's doable. You know, that's hard, but it's doable. You know, even if they decide not to listen, that's no worries. You know, I can handle that. But imagine if there was a wall, not a wall, a piece of tin, right? Separating you and the people, you don't know what they do. You've never talked to them. You're not even sure if you speak the same language, right? And they've never talked to you, okay? So you're trying to do comedy (laughs) for people who aren't in the room, you guys, right, online. So you're trying to be funny, okay? And you know that about seven strangers are listening to it and they don't know that it's comedy because why would anyone be running a fucking film studio podcast space out of a fucking warehouse surrounded by brothels so to them right when i'm doing like a lure review and i go g'day cunts da, 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 and then i then i hit the punchline of a particularly fuck joke maybe the only thing they hear is cunt fuck joke no context and then maybe i didn't deliver that line properly so i have to do that line seven times so all they hear is this incredibly angry australian man yelling in what they assume to be is like a woodwork shop or maybe even a mechanic just going cunt incredibly sexist joke and that just makes me think if i was that person i would think 
I think I've got an insane neighbor. And that makes me self-conscious. I swear, nothing can fuck up a really good take like me hearing someone rustle paper. <laughs> That's the only thing that I get fucking self-conscious about. But god damn, these noise-canceling headphones are so good. Can you, see, can you see how much different I was from the start of the podcast when the only thing that I can hear now is my own voice? Because these headphones are so good, man. They're like they're too they're too good. Like if I got the new the new Beats thing because mine mine died and don't get don't I want to see your fucking comments about oh you fucking bought this and then it died it died after like four years of heavy usage and travel. I got my money's worth right, so I was like cool. It died after four years of me using it every day and treating it like shit, putting it in fucking bags, flying all over the country with them. Great, got my fucking money's worth. So I'll get the new ones, and the new ones, the sound is pretty much the same, except for the noise cancelling is at least three times better, dude. Like, it is insanely good, to the point where I, I'm working, right? I'll be editing something or watching a video, and Keelan will say, hey, Lewis, and he's only seven steps away from me, and he'll go, hey, Lewis, and I don't hear him, he'll go, hey, Lewis, and he will say it four times while I'm listening to fucking Aussie rap or some shit, to the point where he doesn't even try and say, hey, Lewis, when he needs my feedback on an edit he's done, he just turns into a wacky, waving, inflatable tube man that you see out of those fucking, outside those fucking car sales joints, and he just sits at his computer going, just fucking waving at me until I notice. That's how good the noise-canceling headphones are. They're so good that uh, I just I just have to have uh, two pairs of headphones because there is no way I'm going to watch porn wearing these because I don't need a repeat of my fucking stand-up bit about wanking incorrectly, all right? I'm paranoid about that shit. That shit scarred me. Every now and then people ask me, oh, that, that bit about wanking incorrectly and your mum walking in, is that all true? Like I said in the joke, it's not a joke. It's just a thing that happened. Beat for fucking beat, that would have to be one of the only jokes I've ever written, and probably ever will write, where every single thing that I said happened, literally happened. Not like, oh, it happened a little bit and I added a bit of sugar to exact, literally happen. That is exactly what fucking happened. I cannot state that enough, that that joke, really, when people tell me that, oh man, that is so funny, you are such a good comedian, I can't accept that compliment, because I didn't write it, okay, it just happened, and I told you about it, that's all, <laughs> that's the only thing that happened, dream world joke, amazing joke, super proud of that one, wanking story, to be honest, I just capitalized on an embarrassing thing that happened to me, and retold it, I repackaged a heavily repressed memory I remembered that I had. Fucking hell. And and uh, s since then, my mum, has we've still never talked about it. And we never will. And I think both of us are 100% okay with that. <laughs> and now, imagine if you're fucking 30 metres away from me, packaging or sanding something, and you just heard what I've been saying for the fucking first eight minutes of this podcast, all right? You would think that I'm insane, but I don't really care about that right now because I can't hear shit because i got my noise-canceling headphones on. These things are so good that when I wear them on an airplane and if I close my eyes and just listen to something towards the end of the flight, i got no idea that we're landing. I reckon that there could be a fire. I could close my eyes and I could listen to some, some Oz rap, you know, a bit of fucking Forte, Cursor, some Rops One, right? Be listening to that shit. I'll be like, yeah, fucking, I love rap. And then I could open my eyes and the airplane would be empty because it's been evacuated due to a fire that someone's seen out the window. And I would take my headphones off and I would just hear blaring alarms. Evacuate, evacuate, fire detected. And it, they really shouldn't be this good. The noise cancelling on these headphones, I feel like is dangerous. Like, I feel so unsafe crossing the road. Because, yeah, look, I've always been a paranoid person about crossing the road. Dude, you know those cunts that fucking, that, that are not, that are not safe crossing roads? Like, they're the people, my girl does this, and I hate it. I hate it so much. When we're crossing the road, right, I do it like a normal person, right? 
stand fucking three steps back from the road. My girl will literally put her toes on the on the road. Like she'll put her fucking toes on the road and I go, what are you doing? Stand back. And then she will get angry at me for trying to save her life. She goes, no, I'm not on the road. I said, yeah, I understand that you're not on the road. But the thing is, all it takes is for the driver on the road to move three centimeters to the left and you don't have teeth anymore because it's been taken out by the rear view vision mirror. And she goes, no, I'm standing on the sidewalk, so it's safe. I'm like, I don't think you understand. And she's like, you know what she's like? She's like those fucking Eche lads with tracksuit pants holding a 1.25 litre soft drink bottle, right? And they just stand over the safety line at the train station just because the sign tells them not to. And they're like, fuck it, I don't do what I am told. You know them? I reckon, honestly, I thought this the other day. If the government really cared about stopping crime, they would go around and arrest every single person who is drinking a two-liter bottle of soft drink in public because anybody who has gotten like one-third of a way through a two-liter Pepsi Max bottle on the sidewalk is definitely carrying a knife. And that knife has absolutely been used to cut someone before. There is not a single functioning member of society that drinks a two-liter bottle of soft drink in public by themselves as they walk down the street. It doesn't happen. The only people who do that are fucking meth heads, lads with knives who have stabbed people before, and fucking, I guess, maybe in America, incredibly obese cunts. Those are the only three people that walk around with a two-liter bottle of soft drink just for themselves to drink in public like some kind of type 2 diabetes animal. Can we bring fat shaming back? I feel like we should. I gotta say, fat shaming, body shaming, skinny shaming, any kind of shaming, as long as the, the person... There's a caveat to it. I feel like it's really effective as long as the person has a little bit of self-esteem and can look at it look at it objectively. I suppose the problem is when you start fat shaming a 14-year-old teenage girl because she weighs 52 kilos instead of 51. That's probably an issue, but I feel like every well-balanced human needs a little bit of shame in their life because how the fuck are we going to know what to improve? Fuck you guys let me know, huh? I know that when I when I posted that that photo of uh when I got that underwear sponsorship on the Luke and Lewis show, which I'm not going to say on here because they're not paying me to do it on here, so I don't know what it is. I can't remember the name. <laughs> but when I got an underwear sponsorship on the Luke and Lewis show, I knew, right? Of course it would happen. I knew, okay, I have an undie sponsorship, so at some point I'm going to have to post a photo of myself in my underwear. And at, at the at the current at, at the time when I thought that and I realized that I would have to post a photo of me in my underwear for you guys – my mind just mentally read out three pages worth of comments that I would get from you guys in the state that I was in. Skinny can't, slender man, skeletor, all of that shit, right? Oh, you look like fucking, (laughs) you look like anemic Harold the giraffe if he stopped lecturing about meth and started using it instead. Like that's really what I was picturing in my fucking head was just that. So I, I've never been more motivated to go to the gym. And I, w- st- I went to the gym, I started e- eating properly. And I, and you know what, we put that photo up and I look fucking great. I don't look, I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not anywhere near done. I think I can still put on at least like, at least seven more kilos because I'm still a little bit underweight. But I look, I look like, let's, let's say I don't look bad, you know, I got a bit of a chest, I got my six pack back, I'm there, you know, I've just got my foot in the door of an acceptable body. And the comments reflected that, right? Because someone in the photo, Luke, didn't have the same thought as me because he's never really been body shamed like I have by you guys. So he didn't know what was coming. So he didn't do what I did and he just, he got all of the shaming. All of the training that I put into you cunts to body shame whoever you see online really paid off when I posted a photo standing next to Luke because I didn't cop any hate at all. I actually got a lot of very surprised compliments, which is the best kind of compliment when it comes to your body. When, when you take your shirt off and people go, 
Oh, fuck. I just heard someone laugh and that really fucking put me off. I don't... Because, see, I just heard the laugh and it was a really big laugh. So I don't know if they're fucking laughing at me or if they're... Did you see... See what I mean? Like, that's the only thing that makes me feel self-conscious is fucking the thought that strangers are listening. I was on a really good roll then. Fucking hell. I hope they're enjoying the podcast. See, that's the thing as well. Like, you cunts can turn this off. If you get sick of me yelling for 15 minutes about how good body shaming is, you can just listen to fucking Hamish and Andy or whatever, you know? These cunts, they can't. They didn't even choose to listen to it. They're like, they get... (laughs) You know what's funny? I could probably charge you guys to listen to Spearhead Sundays live, right? There'd be a few people who would pay for that. I'm not going to do that. But I could probably, you know, charge to live stream it. That's something that someone would pay for. But 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 these guys get... It's it's a bit different when you are an involuntary live listener of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. <laughs> it's a little bit different. I don't think these guys would be like, man, this is so good. We should knock on his door and pay him for it. <laughs> um Hey, I wanted to uh, give a big thanks to everyone who came out to the first three shows uh, of the No Slide Season Tour. We did Sunshine Coast, we did Gimpy, we did Gold Coast, and they were all absolute bangers. I know I was, I think the last episode I was talking about about to get on Gold Coast, and that was the uh, best show of the tour so far, man. I feel like it always it always takes three shows to get to get the, the show in gear and to work out how it flows and because you always fuck with the order and change things. Uh, but it's been going really well, so I'm, I'm super stoked. Uh, next weekend, however, I am doing the biggest shows ever in Brisbane. I am doing two... Do you, remember the, do you remember the massive, huge, gigantic theater that I did last year in Brisbane? That was the biggest show of my life, like by fucking hundreds. Do you remember that? And we sold it out and it was a momentous achievement. Well, uh, this year I'm doing it twice. So that's fucking very big. And I would love for you guys to come and celebrate and enjoy the show. The show's uh, really, really, really good. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm psyched for it. Tickets are going crazy. Uh, it looks like, uh, man, there's Going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. So that's awesome. Loosebeers.com slash gigs. The first Melbourne show just sold out. I just got my ticket report uh, this morning. Uh, The second Melbourne show. Hang on. Let me have a look at it here. Where are we? No slide season ticket report. Who the fuck's calling me? Fuck off. Um, Where are we here? Um... Where's Melbourne? 450 sold out. Oh, Okay. If you're from Melbourne, buy your tickets fucking now, all right? Because uh, it's going to fill up and I'm not adding another one after this because that's doing two Comics Lounge, that's fucking, that's like a thousand people. So I'm not adding another one after that. That's that's it. I don't want to risk adding another 500 people and then getting fucking three of them in because I could only sell <laughs> 1,003. <laughs> um, but the second one is like fucking very nearly full. So so get in, get your tickets. I'm going everywhere. Loosebeers.com slash gigs, get your dates. Um, and uh, yeah, man, we've been putting up uh, the stand-up clips. I hope you guys are in, uh, enjoying them. We've got uh, a few more coming and uh I've, we've got the first tour vlog me and keelan just did it uh and it's really really good and I, I we already know how we can do it even better than this so i think what i'm trying differently with this year's tour vlog is i'm, I'm i want to make it less less of a vlog and make it as funny as possible because everyone's seen the travel shots everyone's seen me getting on a plane and going to the venue oh look at fucking video everyone's seen that i've done that fucking four times in a row literally so this year we're trying to make them funny we're trying to make something make them something that you can enjoy watching two years from now because it's just me walking around with a lapel mic on talking shit about the town that i'm in going and seeing places maybe uh, going to some experiences filming that including like local crowd work and local references that I think of during the day and then take to the stage, all of that kind of stuff that, that really when you watch it, the show is, so for the first one is, is all three because we wanted to maximize as much footage as we can just while we were still learning the format. So the first one, you really just step into the fucking tour, uh, but mainly it's just like, hey, check out Gimpy Sunshine and Gold Coast. This is my thoughts on it and these are the, the shit parts about it. And I think that 
it, it, it's very funny and um, I'm super stoked with it and it's packed full of stand-up footage that is is maybe like all the stuff that's too short for its own upload or maybe too local a reference. Oh, hello. How are you? Oh, it's, it's jazz. Come on in. See how good my headphones are? I didn't hear jazz coming in at all and that's a big heavy metal door. That scared the fuck out of me. They're so... They're too good, really. I'm going to get hit by a car. Um, what else? Oh, man. Bill Burr's comedy special was so good. I think that's the best comedy special I've watched in years. He's like... I reckon he's one of the best in the world. And and the, and what's funny is the material that I saw him doing it in, in LA at the comedy store only would have been three months ago was none of it was in the comedy special. So he's already turning over like a new hour and his comedy special like has, is out and he's been working on new shit fucking three months ago or probably maybe even six months ago depending on when he filmed it which is crazy um and the stuff that i saw him working on and it was clearly that it wasn't clearly not finished yet to me seemed even better than the shit that he did at the special so like maybe it's because i was there because it was live but like fucking if <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it, I don't know, it's just, it was very inspiring. It was very cool to see how, how good you can get at stand-up. I really recommend you guys watch it. I don't, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but some, some, I reckon like four of the jokes made me like properly howl with laughter. And you, you never get that watching a comedy special, you know. You just sit there with your little nose laughs looking at your phone, <laughs> uh, looking at that shit. But it's, but it's very cool, very inspiring stuff. Um, but I appreciate you guys getting behind all the stand-up clips that I've been putting out to just go for a, a massive downgrade from Bill Burr down to me. You can't really put us in the same sentence, can you? Unless the sentence is, geez, Bill's better than Lewis, isn't he? <laughs> um, but I uh, appreciate you guys getting behind all of the stand-up clips and sharing them and, and everything like that. It, it looks like um, we're going to have a lot of clips coming from the tour. So if you guys share them, I feel like that's the... That's the most shareable stuff that I do because a lot of my stuff is very long or very in-depth or like maybe political or youtube or whatever. But my stand-up is just about the world and, and people and that. And that's my best work too. So if there's anything that I want you guys to share, put in the group chat or, or tweet out. It's definitely the stand-up stuff. Um, so funny, the comments under the, the, the clip that I did about the flume story about him eating that girl's ass. Most of the comments are like, man, this is so funny and this, that, and oh, this is so good or this is hilarious. But then there's there's always, because it's the internet, there's always cunts going, mm, actually, uh, it, was, it, it wasn't a stranger. It was his girlfriend. I'm like, okay, great. So I got one tiny detail wrong about the DJ eating ass on stage. And that immediately makes everything that I said after that not funny. Huh? What is this, a university lecture? My, my girlfriend's nodding her head. She's like that. I'll tell her a, I can never tell jazz jokes because I'll tell her the the idea that I have for a joke and she'll be like, uh, actually, you're using comedic exaggeration there, so I can't enjoy it because it's not true. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And by popular demand, Jasmine's back on the show. Beep, 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 beep. Welcome to the show. By popular demand, she may never return. Depending yeah. on how many noises she makes. Yeah, so I started making this noise last night when we went to... What did we go to last night, Lewis? Oh, we went to... Uh, what and did I drag you to last night that you would have never wandered into on your own? Oh, uh, yeah. In I, a million years. Well, like, if that sentence could be answered with any number of things you've made me go to in our relationship. But last <laughs> night, it was an immersive theatre experience. Yes, it was immersive theatre. For those of you who are long-term listeners of the Spear Sunnies podcast, the last time Jazz dragged me on to an immersive theatre experience... You got mouth raped. I got finger-fucked in the mouth by a strange wearing gloves covering it with spices give her herbs bro <laughs> not good but if but, you want to listen to that okay. it's called the alone experience on the speared sunday's podcast and it was so insane that i did two episodes on it you did two episodes on it yeah because the first one i think i i was like oh i can cover what happened in half an hour yeah and i so i started at half an hour in yeah and then it got to an hour and something i was like i gotta end this and then i came back with part two and that went for an hour so it took me an hour and a half to cover that my sexual assault how long it went for 
Like, how long do you... With two-hour experience. Yeah, it was two so hours. So you must have relived it, like, step to step. Oh, yeah, I'm, st I'm still in therapy about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what did we go to last night? We went to the Edgar Allan Poe immersive theatre at an abandoned warehouse in North Melbourne. It's not abandoned. Oh, that would be illegal, wouldn't it? Well, it obviously wasn't abandoned. It was filled with lots of white people coming to do culture. Yeah, true. <laughs> and surprisingly, a lot of international students. There are a lot of Chinese students. Yeah, i got to say, that's like the first thing where, where that I've been to in Melbourne where it was like 50-50 between white people and like Asian people. Because normally in Melbourne, it's one or the other. It's like white people have their white people shit and mm. then Asian people have their Asian people shit and neither of the groups make any effort to be like, come check out our stuff. It's pretty good. Look at this. Mm. It's like, nah, we'll just do our own thing and fucking if, if either one of you come into our group, we'll all give you weird looks. It's like whenever... It's You're true just though. describing racism. Yeah, I'm pretty much segregation. <laughs> but it's true though. When I go to the, the, the like Asian restaurant that's around the corner from here... Yeah. I, me, I walked in with Luke yeah. and Luke just, we walked out and he goes, did you see all of them just staring at you? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> they were just like, why is this guy in here? You know, the kind of place that doesn't even have, doesn't have English on the outside. So, you know, the food's An good. An Asian restaurant for Asians. Yeah. 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 That, which is the best place to eat food. Is it? It's not, you don't get the best customer service because they, they want you out. But I would think <laughs> but when take you away go, is pretty good. don't you order the wrong thing because it's in Chinese? Occasionally, but you work it out through trial and error. You through trial, trial yeah. and error. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, this time, no one assaulted you, Lewis? Yep, that's good. Yeah? No one assaulted me? No? No. no. Okay, that's great. No one assaulted me. But what, what, why don't you explain what it, what it was? I don't know. It was art. Okay. It was... No, it wasn't. It was a bunch of fucking people who wanted to be actors in a room dressed up in goth hey, makeup. there was an opera singer yeah. in a vintage wedding dress from like the 1800s. Yeah. And she gets murdered and she's got blood all the, down the front. Basically, it was a bunch of rooms and every room was like a different Edgar Allan Poe It was a tribute to thing. Edgar Allan Poe's work. So inspiring from his different poems and stories. Yeah. Um, the world's first emo. It was like completely, the warehouse was completely converted. There was probably like 15 different rooms all with a different theme. And then the the actors went around playing different scenes in different rooms. And you could explore, you could go anywhere you wanted and watch different yeah. scenes. Yeah, so it wasn't, like, it wasn't like you go here and then you go there. There was no instructions. It would just seem like every four minutes or something, a scene would happen and then end. And then the actors in that scene would move on to another room to do a different scene with interacting with different characters. So if you wanted to, you could follow one person around for the whole two hours or whatever it was and you would see them do the whole... Like, I don't think we... We were there for like two and a bit hours. No, I don't think we they saw say everything. that everyone has a different experience because while we... You can only be in one room at a time. And yeah. while you're in one room with one or two actors and they're just doing their piece Seven in other that rooms point, yeah, are happening at there, the same time. There was like... 10 different actors so there yeah. would be five different other plays going on you got to be i think it was on a loop um yeah. every hour it was looped so we got to see probably the first hour we saw you know f 15 different things and then yeah. the second hour we saw a different 15 things mm. um i thought it was pretty cool i really appreciate the set design and the costume design i just like it was seeing, done really well yeah i just like seeing like it blows my mind. I'm like, some crazy cunt decided to do this. And look, they did it. Look at what they created. This yeah, is amazing. I mean, the actual acting, I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, that's some good acting. But I didn't get emotionally involved in it. Like, when I went to the Alone experience, that was a real, like... It, that I was more about you because you're by yourself. Emotionally involved. That was really interactive with yeah. the actors. Like I was playing with different actors. One of them fucked Lewis in the mouth. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> I don't know. That's still to this day. I don't know why. That 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 whole thing gave me so much perspective into like the Me Too thing where people go, "Oh, why didn't you just say no, guys?" Turns out. <laughs> it's very hard to say no if you're put in a room and you just think, "Oh." This is what's supposed to happen in this room. I guess I better do as I'm told. 
Like imagine if that at guy. At the start of the experience, they tell you at any point you can say no to the actors at any sort of immersive theater. Experience, they even told me it was a safe space. They always tell you that if anything that's happening is uncomfortable, just say no. They usually give you a symbol yep. or a safe word. And Lewis still didn't pull the safe word and say, "Get your finger the fuck out of my mouth." He just sat there and let him like just did, sat there did with he my touch throbbing your teeth? erection. Did he like? <laughs> No, it was it was fucked. It was like a it was like it wasn't like a sexual thing. It was like a dentist exam. So we so That's in the so alone funny. experience, quick recap, bunch of different rooms, you go and by yourself and each and you're in there with an actor. So Lewis and I had completely different experiences at yes. the alone experience because yeah. you're you're by yourself and I'm sure they don't do the same thing with every person. Yeah. For example, I slow danced with a mime. He offered me a shot of whiskey and I said no. Mm. And he looked surprised, but he didn't say anything because he was a mime. And then he offered to slow dance with me. But what did you do with the mime? Do you remember? Uh, I think he was even in a different room. He danced room. with me and that was the thing that I said no to and I also didn't drink, but he was it did seem surprised with that um but then there was another room that was like a mirror he tried to kiss me yeah i didn't kiss him yeah. but i reckon he would have been getting so many kisses oh from if you girls. kissed him you would have had herpes for sure he like kind of leaned in and i pulled away because they can't like force you into anything but they're also like everyone's trying to have like an arty spiritual experience oh yeah because so every, it definitely attracts the type of person who's every gonna tumblr kiss. girl would go and be like oh i went in and i did actually you know what he him. looked a lot like the mime looked a lot like the guy who played the raven at edgar Allan poe's thing same face could have been the same same dude could have been the same dude it was very similar i bet that wasn't even the fucking script you know what like the, <laughs> <laughs> the weird like immersive theater scene i'm probably i'm it won't be that big it could be the no, same actor probably could have been <laughs> um but there was your favorite character the ed girl and posing was um they had you know obviously the raven is the most famous poem of ed girl and pose about the raven yeah. who's sort of personified death after he lost a loved one who says nevermore you probably know it from the simpsons episode never that's where i know it from it was the like simpsons the treehouse of horror yeah, yeah but but was the raven so they had a, an actor who was the raven personified and he he was wearing like the, a death mask the ones that yeah. the plague doctors would yeah. wear and he was like really was so creepy he was really well yeah it's meant to be it's meant to be like come into this surrealist yeah um, it's still running macabre. in melbourne of course because yeah, where else called, would it run it's called a midnight visit you go broke if you tried to do that in any other city in australia <laughs> imagine if you did the if you did that in perth it was fucking yeah to you with that bloody gay shit mate I let's do the, burnouts I in the car the park math. instead i reckon they're making fifteen thousand dollars a night yeah easy yeah, and they're only, only 10 paying actors. ten actors. Yeah, I and think, they pay them peanuts. Mm, yeah, there was oh, there was a circus performance. She did like a act on a ring. Yeah, like a what? What are they called? Like a hoop? Like a, an uh, like aerial a trapeze hoop. type thing? But yeah, in a hoop. she she was sexy. Oh yeah, man, jazz. There were two, <laughs> were two. There were two. Fe- two female characters in the thing that were just basically just there to be sexy. They weren't and do wearing sexy much. Stuff, right. So there was the, the the trapeze chick, whatever. But then there was a, there was a chick that was dressed as a cat. She looked like Catwoman essentially. Mm, she and did. Man, women can do anything. Like the amount mm. of perving that women can get away get with. Get away with a lot of perving is insane. Look, but so it's was, her fault. She I, singled I, me out. She danced. Can I explain me. what happened? She no, hang on. She danced to everyone. So you there was no, one room. No, she danced to me. There was one room where there was a table and everyone sat at the table and then this cat woman comes in and she starts essentially do, doing a strip tease she, without it was a, taking it was her a, clothes off. It was a, a smooth flow yoga routine actually. It wasn't a strip tease. Yeah, but she was doing all of she the poses doing, that puts puts I her pussy yoga, in your so face. All right. No, the <laughs> <laughs> she was. That wasn't what I was thinking. Well, that's what was happening, which is which is why all of the guys. Go- you accuse me of perving. Oh, you're just I did, thinking of. I'm not saying cat that I. Pussy. I'm not saying that pussy, I. Pussy. <laughs> I'm not saying that I didn't enjoy having a look, but I'm saying that when I I had a look and I was like, okay. That's See, the acceptable why, amount that I'm allowed to look. This is why women are allowed to perv contact. and men are not. Because why? I'm sitting there thinking, man, this chick's basque muscles look so good. I also thought I this. would like to take her take her out on a date. Hey, and you're I didn't sitting think that. there thinking, 
Oh, look at the vagina. Is no, a vagina in my no, face? No, I wasn't doing that. Okay. Really? That's what you just said. That this was, is why. That was comedic This is why society as a whole has decided <laughs> men cannot perv on people because they can't be trusted. Look, I'm, However, I am being I am lectured. allowed to. I'm being lectured by the this the woman that I saw last night perving on this cat. I've never seen before. <laughs> because I, I you know I had a, she was gorgeous she was sexy I had a look and then and then the, all of the lessons I've been taught as a man was like alright you've had your look that's enough right so bit of eye contact had a look at oh look at the set design whatever then I had a look at you you were just looking straight at her tits Looking her straight in the face. At her tits. You absolutely were. I was you were looking at everything. Her form. You were looking at everything, and mm. uh, the look on your face. If I had that on my face, I would have got kicked out. Yeah, you would have. <laughs> and then, obviously, because they all start moving rooms. She was into it, though. She was into it, yeah. but still, even if she was into it, I couldn't. I couldn't do that in a strip club. <laughs> Yes, yeah, she could. Yeah, I probably could. Yeah, I see, kid, this been. is what I'm saying. He tells a joke that doesn't even make any sense. It made me laugh. That's and all that matters. Everyone else laughs, and I get upset for some reason. Exactly. It's a personality flaw. Um, so anyway, that's whatever. Then the cat leaves, and the scene hey, changes. Hey, it wasn't that bad. I wasn't drooling. I wasn't biting my lip or anything. Um, I wasn't thinking bad thoughts. No, but then. The scene changes and then we go the experiencing some moves, other rooms. Yeah, the actors move. Uh, but every time we saw the cat lady walking past, Jazz grabs me by the hand and follows her. And I was explicitly like, no, we can't follow the girl, the only person in there that does the sexy stuff around because that's not what she's there for. She's not there for everyone to follow her around and perf on her ass. She's there. You couldn't even see her ass. It was covered by her tail. It was, yeah. But still, you did Made do your best to have a look. Though, I have to get. I, I want to try this hoop aerial hoop thing. I think you might I, be too tall for it. Yeah, I might be too tall for it. We'll see. But I looked it up, and there's some around here that do it. It's at pole it places. Would be fun. I would never do pole dancing because I just I, I That's can't. That's not fitness. I can't separate it from like it being a subservient act of like showing yourself off to a man. Well, it's, that's what it is. Yeah, like, that's why it's like this was invented to show how sexy your body is, and it's also a really, really good core cool workout. But that's and a so, coincidence. Yeah, that's a coincidence. Like the yeah. core cool workout stuff came later when they evolved the art form. Like this is so much what <laughs> men want that they would literally pay you for it. Exactly. No one, no one on a Friday night is going, boys. Let's check out the trapeze act. <laughs> no one does that. It's always a, let's go to the rippers. The ri- what are the rippers? The rippers. I heard it. I heard it once. Is that something Dylan said? I uh, know. I heard give it. Give it herbs. What is I it? I heard it in Give It Herbs. Give It Herbs. I heard it in is Brisbane. Is that like a, a and that's weed all... reference? No, that's what I thought. I thought was that is that a weed thing? No, he yeah. just. I honestly, I talked to him for ten minutes trying to get him to explain Give It Herbs. Couldn't work it out. I was like, it whatever, like Colonel Sanders. Herbie, what's that car? You know Herbie? No, no. Because that car could go fast. So if you're saying it about cars, it could have a connection. No, because he said it out of the car. Do you remember that car. Lindsay Lohan movie? With, what is Why it? did Herbie they fully employ loaded? that ice addict to entertain children? Does she, is she an ice addict? Oh, look, that might be a defamatory statement, but I'm just saying, looks like, maybe, in my opinion... Perhaps. I feel so sorry for child stars. Oh yeah, because you know a lot of them. A lot of them get passed I around. I mean, for that. Oh, gross. Yeah, uh, this three, two or three managers in Disney are currently being sued for child abuse, like sexual abuse. Yep. Oh my god. Okay, I was of, gonna say it's mostly like of boys. these Woo, days. Disney. <laughs> these days, if you are a parent and allow yourself, your your child to be like. In movies or specifically like in Disney. I think you can probably be an actor in like one movie and get cast. But if you're like, I'm going to make them a child star. I think yeah. that's child abuse. Oh, if you're, yeah, I'm, like I'm, doing, a jo- I'm doing a joke about it this year. About oh, those, you? yeah, those types of parents. It's only, it's not a huge thing. Like but- maybe back in the 90s when we didn't know. I mean, because yeah. the only one that turned out okay is um, Hilary Duff. Yeah, yeah, she true. never went off the rails. She's she never even going back. They're remaking Hillary. Yeah, Duff. I know. Yeah, but this true. is the thing. It kind of did fuck up her life because even yeah. though she never went crazy and she never went, I have to strip off all of the morals that were placed on yeah. me and try and figure out who I am yeah. because I'm literally just a puppet. 
she never did anything else though. That's the thing. Yeah. She's in her thirties now, and she's never done anything except be. And she's like, I guess I'll be Hillary Duff again. She's just Hillary Duff. That's that's it. Yeah. Like, could make that's kind of stealing a life as well. If you give a child so much wealth and so much exposure that, that like people need goals to strive for, and I'm not saying she has an empty life. I'm just saying, what do you do when you hit success at such a young age? Well, Justin Bieber just put up a big Instagram about that, about how being that famous was amazing but also essentially ruined his childhood and he didn't oh, get yeah. one and that's why he did so many drugs and that's yeah. why he still struggles with success and being that famous and and all that kind of stuff that's, that's why, why i think if you're God and it's everything. so difficult well that would definitely help but it's oh, yeah. so it, when you've done that like you've got there's nothing because so many people find meaning in life by going after goals but when you've achieved so much that there's no conceivable yeah. goal that you could say except he could maybe set a goal like to become an mma fighter or something something that's physically yeah. unachievable but aside from that there's nothing that's unachievable to him yeah like he could write a comic book and it would just become the best-selling comic book ever yeah yeah. And it would have nothing There's to do like with the actual quality. Nothing unachievable to him. So I think then it starts, it's time to start looking like metaphysical meaning. I yeah. would say 100%. That's why, you know, so many of them end up being drug addicts because they can't find meaning. And then that's they, go to, to him. they yeah. go to AA and they yeah. become religious because AA is a very religious program. That's what happened to him. <laughs> oh, did he become religious in AA? Uh, I don't know, but I assume so. He went nuts on drugs and then he came back and God saved him is essentially what's happening. Yeah, because it's the That's only thing career. what's going to... Like, you have to believe there's something else for this life because there's nothing left for you now. You've already peaked. Just kill yourself, Justin Bieber. Hey, maybe not. What? He's not going to hear this. Ah, oh, true. Yeah. Neck yourself, Jay Biebs. <laughs> <laughs> no, it reminds me of, like, uh, the... the I, I knew this super, super insanely rich guy that grew up rich, and he was only 40, so still pretty young. And, like, he had a young body and everything because mm. he was so rich. He was super healthy. And I remember just talking to him and he's, like, um, like what his life is like now. And he was just saying shit like, oh, it's kind of boring. I was like, what do you mean? You've got all this money. You do this stuff. He goes, yeah, but I've done it. I've done everything. Yeah. Like, I've done... By the time I was 30, a I've done every single thing. A lot of meaning in life comes thing. from the struggle of wanting yeah. something that you can't have. So, you have to struggle for it. That gives you purpose. Yeah, exactly. Like he like he moved would... to Australia. He was some big he his he was half Thai or something and his father owned in, an insurance company for oil tankers. Was he Malaysian? Malaysian, yeah. yeah. His father owned an insurance company for oil tankers and he moved to Australia to work as a normal insurance sales health insurance salesman. I think because he was sick of just being a multimillionaire. Mm. Um but then event, last I heard, he's gone back to Malaysia to just stack his money because his dad wanted him there. Yeah. So, good on you. <laughs> I don't know. It was, it's interesting. <clears throat> How did we end up talking about this? I don't know. We're Something about, about the cat circus. chick being hot. Yeah, she was hot. See what I mean? I couldn't say. See how she said that? If I said that on this podcast, I was like, man, this chick, this stranger that I saw during a play that wasn't sexual was so hot. I had to follow her around for two hours. Hey, I didn't follow her around the whole time. You gave it a go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what else was good? There was a there was a bull pit, um, but the bulls were like... If you're listening, cat lady, our DMs are open. Don't. <laughs> She's not listening. Don't. That's too tempting. Um, <laughs> there, was, there was a bull pit and the bulls were like almost squishy it was like a ball pit for oh yeah kids. i don't know why the ball pit was in there because none of the actors went in there it was totally just there because everyone wants to jump in a ball pit some of the rooms were just like people traps obviously to make sure that the rooms with shit happening in them didn't get too crowded so the, yeah. i reckon there were three rooms that were specifically meant was like to be empty each group that went in was like a group of 100 that's why i think yeah. i reckon they're making fifteen thousand a night because the tickets were like 80 to 100 bucks depending what night you went on oh yeah and <clears throat> we booked this when did we book it for originally like a month ago a month ago and this is so smart i'm i need to start doing this this is the smartest shit ever. This it's is like event bright. the best trap ever, right? Oh, yeah. So they, they made so much money out of us. I reckon we're not the only people. Imagine, and when I tell you what this is, you can totally picture yourself doing this 
for sure, right? Because, you know, you hear about something, you buy tickets, you go, oh man, I can't wait to do that. And then the day comes and you go, oh fuck, I don't really want to leave the house, right? You don't really want to go. Well, but something came up. Yeah, but you don't want to waste your money, so you actually go. This ticket service, because the, the thing was running every night for like two months or whatever, they had the option to, on the night, you pay $5 or whatever to reschedule it to whatever night. It was actually $9 per ticket. Oh, no. So $18 for us. Guess how, guess how many times we rescheduled it? I can't remember. remember. Was it four times? It was three times. Three times. So how so, much is that? 18 times 3. That's like almost 60 bucks. It's like 52. Yeah. That's something. like another two tickets. Yeah. And they just made 54. that out of, you know, nothing. And you 100% on, you know, I'm doing two shows in Brisbane. If I offered that, right? If I only sold out night 1 and I only half filled night 2, by the time I actually did it, if that option to change your tickets was available, I would perform on night 1 to a room half full and night two would be sold out because mm. everyone would just be like oh fuck it we'll go on saturday i don't want to go tonight yeah <laughs> should have done that yeah, it was really smart of them <coughs> so smart i think they all should offer that i don't understand why like oh, it's free money. only eventbrite is doing it it's probably just like a coding thing you have to build that yeah um should we do some some we'll do an email here and then we'll wrap it up um, if you would like to, if you need some life advice or you have a good story to tell me, send it into podcast at com, and uh, we will get into it. Um, oh my God. This is a good one. Is 31 too old to get started in comedy? Hey, Lewis, I did my first open mic night at a bar last week where the audience was uh, just the other performers. <laughs> That's how it is. I got laughs in the first 30 seconds, but was pretty dead afterward, which is great because now that feeling of knowing what it's like to bomb is out of the way. That's the right attitude. You should be excited by being shit at comedy because if you're not excited by it, you're going to hate your first two years. <laughs> uh, is 31 too old to get started in comedy? Have you ever bombed at a paid show where people bought tickets to see you? What's that like? Um, how many VIP tickets are on sale for this? There's only, there's a limit of 10 VIPs at every show because I don't want to just fucking pack them out. But anyway, um, is 31 too old to get started in comedy? No, it's never... I think that in everything except for sport, it's never too late to start your, if that's your dream. If you're 31, hey... You're never going to make it in sport because it's your body. I mean, even if you're really old and you want to be a porn <coughs> star, there's a market for that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's something that you would think that you need your body for. But no, yeah. um, 31's definitely not, not too Because they just old. say you just need 10,000 hours Yes. to be really... How many hours do you reckon you have? See, it's quite difficult to get 10,000 hours in stand-up because your stage time is so limited. I definitely haven't done 10,000 hour long sta on oh, shows. Oh, no, it wouldn't. Yeah. But it's probably, it'd probably take ages. It'd probably take decades to get 10,000 hours on stage. But you would have spent 10,000 hours being a comedian. Yeah, I would say so. But even then, like, I'm not a fucking um, pro yet. I think Bill, I'm looking up now, I'm pretty sure Bill Burr started very late. He started yeah. in 1992. In fact, I think that, like, being older gives you a different perspective. Yeah. I've There's a lot of really young people who come in who are, like, 18, 20, and they just don't have much to say. They kind of say the same shit. They go, oh, they just come on stage and they go, oh, I'm going to make jokes about cancer and Hitler because it's edgy. It's like, ah, you're not good enough to do those kinds it of jokes It could be edgy yet. or they also could go the other way and it can be too safe. Yeah. And but I'm just going to be silly and abstract and play an MP3 and dance like a dinosaur. Also, <laughs> not funny. <laughs> but I think um, one thing that really sets you apart when you're a comedian is having a clear voice. Having, yeah. Like... And you can only get that if you know yourself and you know the world around you. Yeah, and I would say that if you're starting comedy at 31, you clearly know what you want to do. That's a lot more... that You have that over the top of any like 18, 19-year-old kid starting out. I think that, that with, with comedy, with, because of the perspective thing, you don't truly become great until you're like 50. 
Yeah, one thing I've heard people say many. I think I heard around comedians in cars getting coffee. Yeah. But they were talking about Jerry Seinfeld and someone someone else who was really old, but a comedian, obviously. We're talking about and saying it's the only thing in the world that you can just keep doing it and you just keep getting better. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, you don't peak until maybe your body starts to shut down and you can't actually do stand-up Not anymore. Not even your body, your mind. You could go out there and kill in a wheelchair. Yeah, but if you've got, like, Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah, that's your mind, though. Yeah. Um, oh, well, I guess so. Yeah. You reckon Stephen Hawking could have done so? <laughs> he could, man, he could have. There's a, guy on, there's a guy on Twitter. He's... I don't know his name. His, his, his name on Twitter is Crip Daddy. Oh. He's in a wheelchair. He can't move. I think, I don't know what he has, but he can't, he can only move his head. And he's funny as fuck. There's a guy in our scene who stutters. Yeah. And he's doing all right. He gets yeah. laughed. I, like I was thinking about it the other day, right? I'm 25 now. If I was an athlete, this is as good as I will ever be. Yeah. And, and I would be only going downhill from here. Imagine that. That'd fucking break my heart. If if I knew, I'd be like, all right, this is probably my last two years of being as good as I will ever be. But with comedy, like when I, if I get to 50 and I look back at me now, I'll be like, man, I'm so much better. Mm. It's the only thing that with age, you get way, way better. So all, all it is, man, as long as your brain works and you're getting the stage time, you will become good. It only takes like five years. And I wouldn't say that c- comedy isn't something where the audience wants their comedians to be young. No, they don't. Because in a lot of industries, say in music, it's like for some reason we only, or pop music especially, mm. we only want the young people telling these stories to us. We only want the young and beautiful people entertaining us. Yeah. But you don't, like, <clears throat> being attractive as a comedian is almost a detriment because then people are thinking about you being attractive rather yeah. than you being funny. For sure. Um, like, that's kind of, I, th- I think that me having facial hair really helped my act because it made me look older and have more life experience. Experience. Mm. Even though it's not a very good facial hair, but for some reason, you just go up there with it with like you know a bit of facial hair, and people go, "Oh, he's gone through puberty. He must have seen some shit. I'll trust him." <laughs> yeah, you know, like whereas whereas when I used to get up there at like eighteen years old, being like, "All right, here's my opinion on this," people would be like, "Who the fuck is this child? Why should I listen to him?" Yeah, there is sometimes I've seen some audiences like. N- not want to hear the because it's you yeah. sharing your your world view on something mm. and making you laugh and the audience has to trust you to take for you to take them on that journey yes. and i have seen some audiences just not be receptive to someone based on like feeling like oh we don't really mesh with this person whereas like there's a some really there's like some 50 some women a woman in her 50s in the melbourne scene yeah. and she's like physically n- not attractive but, but that's her that's her shtick that's her is thing, that yeah. she's like an old woman she's not attractive she's seen so much of the world and she is done with like putting up with their shit also yeah. she and really likes killer. sex yeah. which is hilarious because she's like <coughs> almost yeah. 60 yeah and yeah she is she does crush but um i think the older is sometimes better with comedy in terms of the audience receiving you and writing on on the flip side though you, because you're older, during your shit stage, I feel like it will be harder because it will look a little bit sadder because it will look like you've been doing it for seven years. You know it what I mean? It could, or it could age. look like a bit of a midlife crisis. Which, hey, man, that's just what you got to deal with. I had to deal with you but know, hey, you, being too young and not being taken seriously. You figured seriously. it out before midlife crisis stage. Just Absolutely. hold on to that. Yeah. Yeah, because there there are people who get into it in their midlife crisis because they go, oh, no, yeah. I'm going to die one day and I never did what I really loved and that's comedy and then they're awful. They're yeah. always awful. So just you know, keep doing it. Keep being shit. And fucking enjoy it because uh, you know you you could be you could be starting at fifty you know and so you could just still then work like some comedians don't even get successful until like you can oh, just yeah. blow up at any time. Louis C.K. didn't make it properly till he was forty, and he didn't you know he might make it again at fifty something. <laughs> 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 so yeah, there you go. Um, all right, uh, I'm going to end it there, guys. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be back next Sunday with a brand new episode. Uh, come see me in Brisbane. It's happening next weekend. Two biggest shows of my career, loosebeers.com slash gigs for all the other dates. Massive Woo-hoo. tour. It's a lot of fun. I'll see you at the shows. Have a shit one. <laughs>